Thank you very much for coming, everyone, to my artist talk. It's called An Icelander on the Moon. My name is Bettina Forger. I'm going to be here at Listos <coughs> for the entire month of June. Uh, and I will be talking about my most recent art project and what I'll be doing here. So this is what I will be talking about. Uh, Somnium. This is the project I've been working on. It's a book. It's the first ever science fiction book. And I'll be telling you how this book came to be and how I became inspired by it and why I decided to work with it. Then I'm going to tell you this, the actual story of the book itself, uh, what happens in this book. And then I'm going to talk about the project at Listos. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my work. Uh, I am an artist, but I also run a gallery in Montreal. I'm actually German, but I live in Montreal now for the last uh, 12 years. It's Visual Voice Gallery. It's a small gallery for emerging talent and for a few mid-career artists. And I'm also very interested in astronomy. That's my hobby. It's what I do at night. Normally, people have a serious job during the day and they paint at night. I do it the other way around. And uh, this is, uh, I just want to show you a couple of examples of previous artwork that I've done that, are, that is related to astronomy. This project is called uh, The Naked Eye. It's an installation with um, big paintings as well. The paintings themselves are called Treasure Hunt. And the way this was installed was in the gallery, very a dark gallery, with these very large paintings that are actually uh, exact night skies. So you see the Milky Way and all the pale spots are exactly stars where they're supposed to go. And you could sit in these long chairs and you see right there where the shadow of my, right there, there, those are flashlights. So you could get a star chart and with the flashlight in the dark actually look at the night sky and find the constellations and deep sky objects. So you could be uh, an astronomer yourself. And this is how I made it. I, I used a, like there, uh, an astronomy software, made a big star chart, and then transferred it onto the paintings. And then I did these little miniature, I mean, they're just really like big like this, um, uh, deep sky objects like nebula or supernova remnants or anything that's interesting. Also, a lot of stuff that I've already seen with my own telescope, so I just would plot them all in. So, and the, because they're very textured, sometimes you're not quite sure if you're looking at a piece of texture or if it's actually a galaxy, which is exactly what happens when you're out with your telescope. And you're looking and it's like, am I looking at fuzz? Am I looking at a cloud? Or is this actually a globular cluster? So I just kind of wanted to recreate that experience. Uh, again, more paintings of me at my telescope. And I also uh, organized something in Montreal called Yuri's Night which celebrates Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space. This is done around the 12th of April every year. I organized the Montreal event, especially with the Canadian Space Agency being just south of Montreal. It was a good place to be. So I made a couple of artworks uh, inspired by Yuri Gagarin. And I'm also a member of the International Association of Astronomical Artists, the IAAA. And we are a bunch of artists who are, like me, interested in astronomy, and also a bunch of astronomers who are interested in art. And we uh, have a community online, and we go on field trips, especially to places that look very much like not the Earth. For this one, for example, was in Death Valley. And uh, so sort of we hang around and we make uh, sketches that will be maybe later incorporated into artworks and illustrations. And this guy over there, the one, this one, this is uh, Bill Hartman. He's, uh, uh, he works at NASA Ames. He is responsible for creating what is the currently accepted model for the creation of the moon, like how the, how the moon came to be. And he's also working on uh, what causes the, uh, cratering on Mars. That's his current project. And he also uh, published a couple of books on uh, astronomy and also sort of novel and about space art. And during this trip, he gave me this book on space art. And I read in the introduction about this book, Somnium, uh, written by Johannes Kepler. And what caught my attention was that it said it had never been illustrated. Written 400 years ago, 
and it just languishes there. Nobody pays it any attention. And I was reading this, uh, right. This is my call to action. I'm going, this is my next project. I'm going to do this. And not a lot of people know that this book exists, even astronomers. A lot of my friends who are astronomers, they say, well, you know, I'm not sure. I may have heard of it. I know they're all just faking it because they're embarrassed that they don't know. And you'd know normally Johannes Kepler as a mathematician and an astronomer. And people who do know Kepler know him for his three laws of planetary motion. And I won't go like into this whole thing of Kepler, because then this talk would be a lot longer. But uh, if you go back to your physics class, you m the, the most important thing that he discovered was uh, orbits are elliptical, they're not round. So that took care of a lot of problems of what was happening in the night sky that they sweep out equal areas, so that explains why planets get a little faster as they get to the sun and a little slower as they go further out. And the law, law of harmonies explains um, the uh, relationship between the time of an orbit and how far away a planet is from the sun. So like, you know, uh, Jupiter and Saturn, they can take up to like 30, 50 years to make one revolution, whereas Mercury in the center just goes around like really fast. So he discovered this. And this is what he's known for, but nobody knew that he wrote the first ever science fiction book. And he did this, the seeds from, for this were sown in 1597, when young Johannes Kepler was studying at Tübingen University, which still exists 400 years later. So you can still go and sit in the same classroom as Johannes Kepler, which I think is kind of cool. And he was finishing uh, his studies, and he was writing his thesis, and he followed Copernicus. So at the time of uh, Kepler, people were uh, following the geocentric solar system model, which means the Earth is at the center, everything else revolves around, including the sun, including the stars. Everything revolves around us. Pretty normal, we, all, we humans always think we're at the center of everything. And the church agreed. Uh, but Kepler didn't agree and Copernicus didn't agree. So Copernicus, uh, Kepler followed Copernicus in thinking that the sun is at the center. And that was kind of the new teaching and that's what he figured out. So his student thesis was going to be, imagine you stand on the surface of the moon and that you look back on the earth and all the other planets and then he uh, explained planetary motion. He knew that this was a pretty dicey subject and he wasn't going to give this to his thesis advisor straight up. So he asked a friend, could you ask my thesis advisor and tell him, a friend of mine is thinking of submitting this paper that says you stand on the moon, and blah, blah. what do you think? And this, his friend did so, and then his thesis advisor says, absolutely not, you cannot publish this, you get the university into trouble, you get in trouble with the church, you get disbanded, you never graduate, absolutely not. So he's like, Kepler said, fine, I won't do it, and he wrote on something else. But the idea is kind of, it stayed in his head. And then he got this idea. A Couple of years later, he said, what if I take my paper and I say, I fell asleep, and in a dream, I flew to the moon, and I looked at the sun, and said, that would work because nobody can persecute me because I'm not saying it's real. That's the problem Galileo had when he, Galileo was always saying, no, you know, this is not a mathematical construct. I'm describing reality. And then he got into big problems with the Pope, as we all know that story. And, uh, you know, Kepler and, and Galileo were contemporaries. So he said, I don't want to get into trouble like this, but if I construct, if I sort of pad my science with a little fiction left and right, I may get past the censor. And so he, he wrote by hand uh, this book. He died before it got published because he couldn't find the money to get it printed. The, the princes who were always employing him all over Europe always started picking wars and r always ran out of money and never paid him. So it was his son and his son-in-law after his uh, death in 1634 who finally published the book. And I'm working with the translation because it was obviously written in Latin. And you can still get this. It's very beautifully set if you can get an original. But the, um, the translation most people work with is by Edward Rosen. 